Um, I don't want to cover, cover a lot of the same ground that Jay covered um, politically, but I do want to say some things politically and mix it in with a little bit of everyday life because uh, I think sometimes some of the things that Dave was saying I think are interesting about the idea that you have, and it's a funny way to express it because it's true that people in Syria say, look, this is normal life, and I think, yeah, actually it's not normal life, but it's sort of everyday life, you know what I mean? Everyday life goes on, but it's not normal, of course. Children go to school. I remember the, the first trip I had to Syria in 2013, um, at New Year there was a headline saying, great victory against terrorism, four million children go to school. And I thought, that's interesting, you know, like, what, what, what are they saying there? Because the campaigns by the, the NATO and Gulf uh, Arab-backed Islamists has been precisely to destroy the hospitals. They attack, by 2013, they attack three quarters of all hospitals. Why? To get the confidence of the people? No. To destroy the state? More likely. Uh, they were attacking the schools, the universities. They had pamphlets um, in Aleppo in 2013, joint pamphlet from Jabhat al-Nusra and the Free Syrian Army saying, don't send your children to the university until the regime falls. And then they rocketed the university, killed 80 people, and blamed it on the government. And that's been a pattern I've been following as a researcher for, for the last four years. Now here's the two stories you've got. The one on the right you'll be familiar with. There is a debate going on there, whether it was Q&A the other night or any other uh, article you've been reading for the, for the last four years, that we have to fix the problems of Iraq or of Syria, the imperial prerogative, I call it, which of course has no basis in international law. It has no basis in international human rights. But it's sort of become a part of the furniture and we're used to hearing that sort of thing. And then from that, we get this heroic Western mission to save oppressed people from their brutal dictators, whether it's genuine brutal dictators, Saddam Hussein, or the false stories they told about Muammar Gaddafi in, in Libya, which they then retracted after Gaddafi had been assassinated. The shifting pretext, initially there was the idea there was a secular revolution which the, the West was going to support. Then when it was clear that most of the pre-Syrian army, they said, we are all Jabhat al-Nusra. Then it was clear that they were Islamists. Then they said, well, these are the, the pious Sunnis, the moderate rebels. And now with the, the creation of the super, the super Islamist, the, the ISIS or whatever you want to call it, there's this renewal of what Bush regime started in 2001, which was the war on terror to protect the, the, the world or the United States from terror. So a series of shifting pretexts really for keeping a foot in that region. And the violence, as it's reported, if you see, you'll only really see uh, the violence from the Syrian government as being <coughs> indiscriminate or targeted attacks on civilians. That's really all you'll read of the operations of the Syrian army from the Syrian Arab army, as it's called, from this side and occasionally the atrocities of the, some of the extremist groups. The end game, uh, and there's a paper out by one of the big think tanks in the US at the moment, the end game, which is really to me a plan B, because they haven't really succeeded, they lost a couple of years ago the idea of changing the regime in Damascus, is to look forward to some sort of dismemberment of the state. Now Israel's talking about annexing the Druze region in the south, and they're talking about cutting out the, the coast and the uh, some sort of Sunni region where ISIS is at the moment in the northwest of Syria. So that's the B story which you're familiar with. I want to put that to one side and stay with the A story, which is that the one which I introduced, that there are proxy armies of sectarian fighters who have been trying to destroy non-compliant uh, regimes across the region in the last four years. And they succeeded in Libya. They thought they could succeed in Syria. They haven't succeeded in Syria for a couple of reasons. One, because Syria has some strong allies. Iran and Russia for one thing, and another thing is the Syrian army and the Syrian people have got behind their army, and that's the most popular, uh, Father Dave said Bashar al-Assad is very popular, it's true he's popular, it's true there's a personality cult, it's also true that he's genuinely popular, but the one thing more popular than Bashar al-Assad is the Syrian army at the moment there. And the displaced people in Syria will always go to the army areas, including the families of the jihadists. So. Um, in Suez, for example, our friends have overheard some of them saying, look, we've got everything we need here and so on, but there's all these kufra, you know, these unbelievers around us here, basically. But they go to the army areas to get protection there. You know that the disarmament and regime, regime change operations in the region have been going on for 14 years now. <coughs> Every last one of them has had serious lies about them. You recall that there was a mass destruction in Iraq. You may or may not have looked at the Libyan situation there. Jay mentioned the attempt by Israel in 2006 to disarm Hezbollah in the south of Lebanon that failed, basically. 
the 14-year attempt to disarm Iran or to, you know, to impose sanctions on it has just recently failed. That's very interesting because it means that the, the voice of Iran, the second biggest country in the region after Egypt, is now going to be very important in, in regional politics. In my view, the aim has been, first of all, to get regime change for a compliant regime, uh, and failing that, to dismember the state or disarm it, and really there's something very similar happening in Iraq, it's happening in Syria along those sorts of lines. In the background of the slide is one that's been drawn, one of several that's been drawn up in the US with the idea to dismantle the country, a second Sykes-Pico plan, they call it. And the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in Syria and in the region has a similar idea to the North Americans along those sorts of lines. To further break down the states, but to break them into small uh, sectarian states. In that sort of context, of course, Israel as a sectarian state would have much more legitimacy to it. The violence is really daily. Um, Father Dave mentioned you didn't hear too many, um, too many bombings when we were there. It's true, actually. When I was there two years ago, every morning I heard mortar and artillery exchange on the eastern part of Damascus. This time, it was occasionally, not so much. They pushed them back somewhat. They hadn't got rid of them. Um, and the interesting thing for me was, although I've been studying it for four years, um, in 2013, I tried, we did travel to the north of the country, Tel Aviv. Uh, but we went, we flew up there, and the, 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 uh, they call them tuck ferries, the sectarian groups there were in Malula, the old Christian town at the time. They were still in the Kalamun Mountains on the Lebanese border. They were in parts of Homs. They hadn't been completely driven out of Homs by then. And the road to south to Suwaita was too dangerous for us to go there. I had to abandon the trip because of that. This time, I went to Suwaita from Damascus. We drove up through Homs to Tartus to the Tuck and all the way back. We did one detour around a an area that was north of Damascus where there was fighting. So something strange was going on because what we were hearing here was there were these advances by the Islamic State in the last two years. Certainly that's true in, in they occupied Raqqa for some time, they moved into Palmyra, there was an invasion of groups from Turkey, but the actual security situation in the major cities was better than it was two years ago, and I wasn't expecting that. Um, this is uh, the evening of Aid in Damascus in the Hamadiyya market. Just to say that in summer, um, it's extreme, extremely hot in Damascus in summer. People stay at home in the afternoon, they come out in the evening. This is about midnight in the evening. And I was surprised to see, for example, uh, in, old, in the old city, and then we went back to the, the Mazza area up on the hill there, two o'clock in the morning, tens of thousands of people in the streets going out to, going out to eat, amazing sort of slice of everyday life but in the middle of this in the middle of this war. The character of the, of the conflict I would say to simplify it is you've got it's it was they tried to hide at the beginning but basically all of the groups fighting against the government are uh, sectarian Islamists. They want some sort of caliphate. They squabble amongst each other from time to time. But ideologically the Syrian army, the Syrian Arab army comes from all of the different communities in Syria and Syria is an, an extremely <coughs> pluralist place. Um, one thing that impressed me a lot on the first trip to Syria two years ago was that the old mosque in the centre of, uh, they call Bumia Mosque in the centre of Damascus, in stone it has a whole lot of multicultural aspects. So 1,300 years old, I think it's 1,300 years old. It's got the, the, the minaret of Jesus of Christ. It's got stars of David. It's got the remains of John the Baptist. It's got all the different groups within Islam there. Um, and it's got the, the Temple of Jupiter out the front from the Romans. So all of this stuff has survived a very long period of time to say that while there's been sectarianism in the region, particularly from the Gulf, the Gulf monarchies, there's been pluralism in the region as well. That pluralism is very deep. And the army represents that sort of pluralism because one thing that Hafez al-Assad, uh, the current president's father, instilled in people was to say, you are Syrian, and they resent you if you say, you Syrian, so, yeah, you Shia, yeah, you Druze. They actually resent people doing that. It's been instilled in them that, that everyone is Syrian and everyone is a part of this, this state. And that's what people see in the army there. Um, do they, uh, do they, are they brutal with the armed groups? Yes. Um, do they kill prisoners? Yes. Do they target civilians? No. I've investigated that. I've investigated a lot of the major issues. I'm not going to go into it now. I've just about to complete a book on, on this. And uh, none of those claims about targeting civilians have had a substance to them. This is an area called Yusham, just north of Damascus, um, which is a safe area. Of course, there's a lot of security. There's checkpoints. There's checkpoints all around Syria. 
their security as you go into these areas. There was a controversy when it was built last year because some people were saying, how come the government spends so much, much money opening a centre like this when people are suffering during the war? And the other side was the war's been going on for four years, family life goes on. And the interesting thing about this centre is here we call it a commercial centre, but there, centre of it is children's activities, rides and sports and things like that, and restaurants, and the commercial stuff you can see there at the top is sort of on, on the side of it. Very, very big. So this is midnight, midnight, and there are tens of thousands of people using it. Well, they're using it. Life goes on even though the war goes on. This area is not getting mortar. Um, there's a lot of maps being put out about who controls what in Syria, and I've been reading them for a few years, and to my mind, there's a big methodological mistake in them. One is that they confuse control of territory with the presence in a territory. I think it's, it's fair to say that most of Syria has a presence of terrorist armed groups fighting the army and attacking cities. Um, but actual control of territory, uh, it's relatively small. There's a northern part of Aleppo, perhaps 15-20% of Aleppo. Most of Raqqa and Palmyra recently you know, was taken over. And there's some intense fighting going on in the east part of the desert and in Idlib next to Turkey because the Turkish government is allowing groups to keep flooding in from there. In the south, around Dara, because Israel and Jordan are resupplying, giving refuge to them. And you saw the photo of Netanyahu with wounded, uh, wounded Al-Qaeda groups there. Israel calls it humanitarian program. So despite all of that, the government seems to control the great majority of the populated areas. You know, all this part to the, to the, uh, to the east is, is desert, basically. They're the major cities there. Damascus is said to have swollen to 8.5 million from about 5 million. So the displaced people, most of them, most of the refugees have moved within the country. Um, there's 130,000 families that have gone from Dara to Sueda. Sueda was a mainly Druze area, now it has another half a million uh, Sunni families basically living in Sueda. So that's over a million. Latakia, uh, which was about 1.3 million people four years ago, is now the second biggest city in Syria because it has more than 3 million people that have come there. Tartus has also grown enormously. So the coast has swollen, the populations have swollen because they've come in from, from the areas uh, along the Turkish border and from Aleppo where that fighting has been going on. Um, but the government does control most of the populated areas. This is the independent Christian MP Maria Saleh in the Opera House for, there's an exhibit, photographic exhibition of victims of terrorism in the Opera House and there was a conference we went along to on the victims of terrorism there. She's in the parliament. There's been a slow move away from the one party state in Syria since 2005. Um, I suppose the most uh, the iconic symbol of that was a, a, a competitive presidential election last year in which everyone believed that Bashar al-Assad was going to win. Uh, but all of the enemy polls on the support for the president were pretty much the same. Whether you were talking to the Islamist fighters in Aleppo, the NATO consultants, anyone else, they said he had about 70% of the support in the country. And indeed that's what the election showed. That, uh, Tony there said it was 88% of the 73% turnout, which is about 64, 65% uh, of the whole, pop, the whole eligible voting population. And as Father Dave said, uh, there were huge traffic jams in Beirut. They clogged up central Beirut and uh, the Syrian embassy ran out, of, um, ran out of papers there for that participation. You don't have that sort of participation in the US. We do here, we've got a compulsory system. In the US they don't, they have 50%, 60% turning out. There they had 73% in a war turning out. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, but the Western media ignores the opposition parties that decided to reject foreign military support and a, a, a military attacks on the government, basically. There was a thing called the Damascus Declaration of the Civil Opposition in 2005, uh, which almost all the opposition groups were involved in. The Muslim Brotherhood pulled out of it fairly quickly. Um, but two of the principles in there was we don't want a violent reform process. We want to keep the stability of the state to see the, the, the reforms go through. The president of the Syrian Social National Party, which is now in a coalition with the, the Ba'athist government, said the same thing from the beginning. They wanted a lot of those reforms. They supported the reform movement in 2011, but they didn't want the state to be destabilized there. So what ended up happening was, except with, with the exception of the Kurds, who had some of their own agenda in, the, in, their, part of, uh, in their part of Syria, the, all of the, uh, the parts of the opposition that went into the army 
insurrection were Muslim Brotherhood allied Salafi groups. And that's why you see the character of them all. The old Free Syrian Army groups, which barely exist these days, but they all declared allegiance to the, the Al Qaeda groups. This is part of old Damascus, Sub Sharki, which was a Jewish quarter, and in the eastern part of the city. This one does get mortared. Um, in Babtum and the Christian area in Babshaki, they get mortared. Uh, used to be almost every day. It's not quite so much now because they pushed the nucleus of fighters from mainly the Islamic Front and Jabhat al-Nusra back towards Duma out of Joba, but they hadn't cleared. That maybe there was 20 or 30,000 armed fighters in that area around Duma at the moment where they were saying civilians were being barrel bombed. There are no there are no civilians in Duma except those that want to be there or the families of the fighters that are there basically because it's been occupied for at least three years. Similar with the far northern part of Aleppo basically. Um, but they pushed them back somewhat from that area but there are still mortars that come in from the Joba area into this part of uh, Damascus. This by the way is Straight Street via Rector in the Bible, that one there. And off to one side you've got the oldest Christian church in the world where St Paul was baptised. So this sort of the antiquities are everywhere, basically, in Syria. And you see the two women on the top balcony looking out there. People don't want to leave uh, old Damascus. I asked a friend about the rents there. They haven't gone down, despite the war, and despite the fact that they get shelled there. This is something that uh, Father Dave talked about. The outskirts of Yamuk, the Palestinian camp, they call it a camp, really. It's a suburb of Damascus. It's been established there for a very long time, I think around 60 years. Um, there were 150,000 people living there. Um, it's almost a ghost town now. There's less than 10,000 people in there now. Uh, most of them have gone out to other parts of Damascus, basically. Um, and this little family, there was only about 40 people in a school on the outskirts of Yamuk. Now, the, the checkpoint, you see there, you're not meant to take pictures of checkpoint, but I snuck one in, basically. The, the checkpoints um, are heavier around Yamuk because they've got a cordon around there, basically. The army has a cordon around there, and the army doesn't go in, but there are Palestinian... Uh, militia that are loyal to the army, that work with the army, that go in and try and resolve the issue there. What happened in April this year was that there was a militia that Hamas had in there and they kept inviting Jabhat al-Nusra in, thinking they could work with them. And there was a few agreements, they went out again and they, they came, you have a few snipers and all the traffic basically come to grinds to a halt. They can't get aid in there if there's snipers in there. So um, what uh, that Hamas group, the armed group, I've forgotten its name, did was they invited in Jabhat al-Nusra. Jabhat al-Nusra invited in ISIS um, from, coming from the south, from Jordan, and uh, basically they attacked the, the Hamas armed group. The Hamas armed group split three ways. Um, some of them were killed, some of them joined ISIS, and some of them went and sought refuge with the army. They effectively destroyed, the, the Hamas armed group effectively uh, destroyed or joined uh, one side or the other, basically. So it is an ISIS-occupied area. There may be uh, something between eight and 10,000 people there. So we went to the outskirts just to see a family and Father Dave was doing that, um, doing some therapy for the kids, basically. And actually, the girls were wanted to box as much as the, as the boys. This is the aquatic centre we mentioned, the Kishrine Aquatic Centre. We were just waiting for something else to win in there. there was, I think there was 2,000 kids in there learning to, learning to swim. Part of this idea that life isn't normal, but these everyday sort of things are, are going on in that in that context. The university is interesting to me because I, um, of course I work in a university, but uh, I was surprised the first time I went two years ago to find that the Kishrein University, the second one we went to, the number of students is 150,000 in one campus. And we walk around the campus. This university has 60,000. This is one of the biggest universities in the country, so it's 60. Kishrein had 150,000. Damascus University, um, which we saw they, the, the, the Al-Qaeda groups had mortared it. They'd mortared it the cafeteria and part of the architecture faculty. They killed, I think, 13, 14 students um, two and a half years ago. But basically, and there's a memorial to those students there, but basically life was going on. Almost 200,000 students in Damascus University. Why? Because it's virtually free. Higher education is free there. We used to have it. Um, they're, very, they're very poor. Uh, there, but the, the higher education minister, and this is so different from someone who in the university system, the higher education minister said to us two years ago that um, yes, they did charge fees. There was about ten dollars the students had to pay a year, and they were very proud of that, and they're going to keep it at that. <laughs> so that level of participation then is, is extremely high, and the level of education is very high. I have to say in Arabic, like I think that because Arabic is so strong, maybe it squeezes out the other languages, but. 
their commitment to culture and education is extraordinary. So there's large groups of young people are, are very well educated. This is in the south of Syrian Square, um, which is a, a big volcanic mountain and, and sort of quite distinct um, in an agricultural sense and, and geographically. The, um, this is, life is going on. In fact, strangely enough, the economy is booming in these areas where large numbers of displaced people have gone to, like Latakia and Tartus. So there's a huge building boom going on there. And Swater also. Um, uh, there are shortages around the country. Those shortages apply to these areas too. But in terms of the traffic and the economic activity, the hotels are full in Latakia. Hotels are full. Uh, and the merchants coming from other parts are going there twice a week instead of once every two weeks, you know, because there's this huge population. There's unemployment, there's shortages, there's poverty, but somehow there are these shared services and infrastructure. Uh, Jay mentioned uh, low GDP per capita, but the roads, the traffic, they are full of garbage, you know, they won't collect the garbage. <laughs> in, in Damascus, things function somehow. People are short of things, but somehow they're, they're surviving. The salaries aren't enough for them to survive. Somehow they're getting, uh, they're getting social support there, basically. So those safe areas have had this huge influx and uh, I think the economic situation is significantly worse than it was two years ago. But somehow other because there are these very strong social bonds and social systems, people are not fracturing. This is, the bottom one is, by the way, Roman, Roman columns of basalt there next to the corner store more or less. So once again, you've got these antiquities that sort of go in and, and houses get built out of 2,000 year old uh, parts of old buildings. Um, the good news from the point of view of the resistance, or the axis of resistance, as Jay pointed out, is that within the region, what Washington's been trying to do, you know, with Afghanistan, with Iraq, with Libya, um, is really fracturing. Um, one, because of the Iran deal. The Iran deal, of course, lists the voice of the senior partner in that regional axis. Um, and Iran is the second biggest country in the region. The, Egypt went back to the status quo, more or less, after the, after the, Muslim, the briefly lived Muslim Brotherhood government, because there was no other opposition organized, basically. But the, the, the army couldn't stand that sort of sectarianism. They, the Salafi sheikhs basically declared war on, on, on Syria from, from there. So they went back to the status quo of a military regime, more or less. But because they've got some similar problems to Syria, they're slowly, despite their involvement in Yemen at the moment, they're slowly warming up their diplomatic relationship. It was never broken, but that relationship is improving. They now support, Egypt, Egypt now supports, for example, the integrity of Syria, not to break it up. They support the Syrian government's struggle against terrorism in the region there against the Muslim Brotherhood, of course. And in Turkey, things are changing too, because Turkey is not necessarily naturally an enemy of, of Syria, but the Erdogan government has seen itself you know, as a leading figure in a Muslim Brotherhood-led region. Uh, that's now, the wheels are falling off that because the you know, has a majority in the, in the Turkish parliament, they're going to another election. It seems like the measures that the Turkish government did in closing down some of the, some of the refugee camps in Turkey has contributed to that huge uh, outgoing of, of uh, refugees, which was largely going from Turkey, about half of it was going from Turkey to Greece, basically. That's where the big traffic was. Uh, but some of them have been in Turkey for a long period of time. And a lot of the fighters that had refuge in Turkey also were going across with them. Um, the United Arab, Arab Emirates, which uh, Vice President Joe Biden said were one of the groups funding, admitted were one of the groups funding ISIS um, uh, about a year ago, they're now improving their status because there's a group now that's, they've arrested a few dozen uh, sectarian uh, groups that were wanted to overthrow the, the despotic monarchy with a despotic uh, sectarian state. So um, they're shifting a little bit there. Um, and Lebanon, of course, uh, there's a strong ally there in Hezbollah, which has helped Syria in recent times shut down the, um, uh, or secure the Lebanese border in the Kalamur Mountains. The last element of that was Zabadani, which the, fighting, the last of the fighting was going on there as we were there. Um, basically, they surrounded the town. They were letting people get out, screening them as they went out. And then as they've been uh, finishing off that operation now, the the Islamist groups are saying, oh, they're barrel bombing civilians there, basically, because that's their last resort, basically. We visited soldiers in hospital who were wounded in that, uh, in that, uh, in that operation. They, in other words, they didn't go in and carpet bomb Sabadani. They haven't gone in and carpet bomb Duma, although it's been occupied for three years. They haven't gone in and carpet bomb the north of Aleppo. A lot of Syrians wish they would. 
they said it to us, why don't they just go in and do that? But they've really done it at a street level of fighting, which, it would, which their training is mainly coming from Iran, by the way. A lot of Syrian soldiers have gone to Iran to be trained in that sort of house-to-house <coughs> fighting style. So things are turning in the region, um, and I think that looks good. I want to end up here just with, um, and then uh, we'll take questions for any of the, the speakers except Reem. Um, uh, this last thing, we went to um, we went to a uh, to do an interview in Syrian television. On the way up, there was a vigil for a journalist, Al Ashlani, who was killed uh, the previous day. Uh, he was with the, with the army, and there was an, a mortar which killed several soldiers and that journalist there. Uh, but there's a memorial in front of Syrian TV of all of the Syrian journalists that have been killed by Western-backed terrorists, basically. This is something that doesn't get mentioned in, in, the, in the Western media. I've found, as someone writing a lot on the Syrian crisis in the last four years, that there's an incredible exclusion of anything that's really favourable to, used to be Iran, now things have turned around a bit with Iran, with Syria, with Hezbollah. Uh, criticism of Washington, yes. Criticism of Tel Aviv, yes. But anything that seems like it's uh, in a war circumstance, that seems like it's favouring the enemy, an absolute exclusion there. That's all for now. Thanks.